Welcome back to the Atlanta Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Arsenault. On this episode, we have Doug Doucette, president of RCS Construction and Millwright Woodworking. We'll talk about Doug's entrepreneurial journey, traction, and EOS, hear some great stories, and hear a lot of history about both companies. Hope you enjoy. Well, welcome back to the Atlanta Construction Podcast. Our guest today needs no introduction, but I will anyway, Doug Doucette. Uh, thanks for being here, Doug. Um, Doug's the owner and founder of RCS Construction and Mill Rates. Um, Doug's uh, clients and companies that he's worked with uh, in Atlantic Canada are some of the top who's who. Uh, some of them include North American Development Group, Crombie, Sobeys, Canadian Tire, Choice Properties, Loblaws, <coughs> Walmart, and the list goes on. Um, yeah, thanks for being here, Doug. That's a pleasure. Looking forward to it. First podcast? First podcast. Great. We're happy to be your first. <laughs> first uh, of many. First of many. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just uh, give us a little background on, you know, uh, starting RCS, where you're at then, how far it's come. Um, I'm sure that would take uh, a long time. Maybe you can sum it up. <laughs> and, uh, there is a 45 minute version, but I'll try to do it in five. But right. I, I started Four the years. company in uh, 1996. So we're in our 25th year. We'll actually celebrate 25 years on September 30th this year. You know, uh, we've come a long way. We're a little unsophisticated company back in 96. I started the company with a fellow named Bruce Mullins, who uh, went on to start his own company after we parted ways, and Stan Carew, who was a very good friend, and uh, we traveled down from Ontario to kind of start renovating grocery stores was the intent, and it grew to being what it is today. Today we have, you know, probably upwards of almost 140 employees, and uh, we just cracked 100 million in sales last year for the first time, so... There's a long story in between there. Yeah. Is there like a, is there any points within that growth of the last, was it 90, 93, 96 that 96. you started? Where it was like, you know, kind of key points in, in those years where you took certain steps to kind of blo- get things uh, doubled or tripled for sales or whenever things kind of had those milestones that you can think of? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's a, there's a couple that definitely, uh, especially the times we're in today. Today, this these times will be one for sure. But, I, you know, the first 13 years in business, I was people always said, you know, was there a big transition from going from working for someone else to working for yourself? And I'm like, I don't think so. I don't remember it being a transition. Like, it was literally working for somebody yesterday and today working for herself. Because when we worked for somebody else, the three of us, I will say, we all were pretty hard workers and we were pro- probably pretty driven in our organizations. So... I went to work yesterday to work the best I could, and I went today for myself to do the best I could. So it's always been a do the best you can do kind of mentality. And I always felt that at the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the year, if you gave it your best shot, that, you know, good shit would happen. But I would say for the first 13 years, I don't know that we had a negative quarter in growth or sales or profit. So come 2000, I think eight, it would be, we were having the best year. We were going to hit 48 million in sales and it was phenomenal. And uh, the bottom fell out of her down in the U S when we had all the bank issues, but we were still going strong. We were still, you know, it was it was going to shit down there, and we were just still, mo- and we just, I don't know, whatever made us think, because we had never hit any depressed times as a company. This that is we, in 08, right? This was in 08 going yeah. into 09, and, you know, in 08, the, it had already fallen in the U.S., and 09 was when it hit us, and uh, we were naive to think that we were just going to keep trucking, and just the bottom came out of it. I mean, it literally stopped. Um, it, we were at a time when we just, you know, it was unprecedented with the bank issues down in the U.S., and... And let's face it, we're Canada. They're the they're the big sister, the big brother, and whatever happens down there is going to affect us. And that, we didn't see it coming. Um, the next uh, four or five years were very, uh, I want to say, up and down. Like it was tough. It was tough. We would make a million bucks. We would lose a million bucks. I mean, we were going through some growth uh, issues. I mean, all of a sudden, you were really challenged. Like when you run a business and it's profitable quarter over quarter, year over year, it's really easy to make decisions. You know, if the guys want four-wheel drives, you just buy them because you got money. If the guys, you know, got tough decisions, decisions get tougher when you're not making money. So, you know, issues. that's when I had my breakups with my partners because we couldn't agree on, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know I want to do this, they want to do that, and then it becomes fighting. And when there's, a, when there's a nice check or a bonus check at the end of the month, you can put it all aside and look over top of that and move on. But when you really think you're making the best decisions for the company from the heart then you really, you know, it's when it gets tough. So yeah. that was in 2009. So that was a big one. The next four or five years were tough. And then uh, we had a 
life-changing moment, I will say, when I, uh, we were introduced to EOS, which is an entrepreneurial operating system, which is called Traction. I've read and the book. You read the book? It's a great book. <laughs> it's a fantastic book. And yeah. It, it was the, um, I'm going to say it was where we hit the, we had hit the growth wall. We were at 50 million in sales. You know, we went through four or five years of tumultuous times up and down. And then all of a sudden, you know, Stephanie said, Doug, you got to read this book traction. And I'm like, Stephanie, we were building one of her restaurants at the time. I said, I can't read You know, I, time I get to the bottom of the page, I'm trying to solve all the world problems. I just can't do it. <laughs> and she's like, Doug, you got to read it. So she called me in November and she said, did you read the book yet? I said, nope but I'm going on Christmas holidays and I'm going to be down in Florida and I promise you I'll read the book. So I got in the hot tub and I started reading the book and I'm like, wow, the book's pretty good. And I think what was exciting about the book was everything it was telling you to do in the book. We had done a lot of things. We had a lot of practices in place. We had a lot of process in place for a small company, but the book closed that gap. So I would say I was doing 75% of what the book said you should do, but when I read the rest of the book and I got into it and I finished it in two days and I called her right after and said, Stephanie, oh my God, this is going to change the way we do business. Like I just was, it was a profound moment that I've got to get all the leadership to read this book. Everybody's get on, got to get on board. And we did. And we immediately made a lot of changes, significant changes in the office. We had to let go some key staff. Um, we had to let go people that didn't fit, you know, weren't in the right seats. The book's all about hiring people in the right seats, you know. Getting, having the capacity, the ability, and the want or the desire. So when you answer those questions and people don't fit, you make changes. And since since we reorganized our leadership team, we've got everybody in alignment. The the uh, the, the company has taken off like wildfire. We hit over 100 million in sales last year, um, projecting for 130 million this year, and we want to be a 250 million dollar company in seven years from now. So so that book got you from 60 70 mil to 100. It got us from about 60, yeah, 60 to 100 mil in uh, two years. And and for our listeners, Traction and EOS, is it's very process-based, right? It's all about, is it delegating and, like, whenever you just how to machine, like, every everything from the orientation point out? Is that, it's, how would you describe it? It's accountability on steroids. It's, like, just, it's a, it's a tool for accountability. Today, people need help. You know, there's the old rule. That, you know, they say that uh, 20, 60, 20, it's a Harvard business study that says 20% of, you know, people in most companies are underachievers, 60% are average or plus average that get most of the work done, and 20% are the overachievers. And the actual study goes on to say that, and this was in the book, that you can't, you can't take somebody from two notches. So why try to take an underachiever and help them be average or, you know, why try you, you want to work with your average employees and spend all your time trying to make them overachievers and giving them the tools to do that. But the, the majority of employees need process. They need process. And that's the big step to go from, I would say, you know, a small company to a mid-sized company is having process so that you get delivery. We call it RCS 101. It's just a matter if you're dealing with, you know, Dan or Doug or Andrew it's always the same process. It's always driven. The, cut, the, the projects are all run the same way, the same direction. And that's that's been critical for us. Right. So it's basically eliminating all mental energy spent that's not going to be fruitful. Yeah. it's You know, it's it's getting everybody aligned with your vision. I mean, we have what we call a, a VTO. And the VTO sets your goals, your quarterly goals, your yearly goals, your goals for five and ten years. And it's, it's understanding that. It's sharing that. You know, back in the day with the big organizations, they do all this strategy planning and they do all this, you know, bring people in and do color pictures and get everybody rah, rah. Well, this this is more simpl simplis simplistic. It just, yeah. it's like, let's all get in a room. Let's do what we say we're going to do. Let's put our heads together and, you know, that gives us a list of achievements and let's, let's focus around, you know, doing this all together yeah. as a team. So it's really engaging. It's not it's mm -hmm. not far fetched that an outsider can come in and just get everybody feeling rosy. That's not the way it is. It's getting people engaged within and making them a part of it. That's right. a big deal. I want to go back to what you were saying um, about one day you're working and you know the work ethic is there and obviously the entrepreneurial spirit. And then the next day you started your own thing and it didn't feel any different. How old were you when you started uh, RCS? I was 28 years old. I was actually in university, you know, to say a little bit more of the story, I was in university to be an accountant. And I only went to university to be an accountant because my mom said you should be an accountant. So I'm like, okay, she was an accountant and she's a mentor of mine in her, in her own right. She was a hardworking uh, business lady as well. But, you know, I, I just was one of three boys. The four girls went to university. Two of the boys didn't. They chose to follow in their dad's footsteps and work with the company business. And I said, I'll go to university. 
well, little did I know it wasn't cut out for university and little did I know I hate numbers to this day. I'll never be an account. I don't even look at, I don't even want to look at my balance sheet because uh, I think as an entrepreneur, you Except feel when you're having a good year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're having a good year, you know, when you're having a bad one. Um, but so, sorry, no, to go back. So I will finish yeah, that story. So yeah, of course. I, um, I actually dropped to the university on September 16th and um, my girlfriend at the time was pregnant. So I had to, you know, it was the right thing to do in my mind, go to Toronto and get a job. But in all, in all reality, I just wasn't cut out for university. It wasn't me. I needed to get into the business mode. But I started on a construction site, sweeping floors, and I just worked my way up. I worked really hard. And I would say that when I worked in that construction site for my first job in Toronto, you know, sweeping that floor, I had a 100,000 square foot warehouse. And for five or six months, that's all I had to do was keep that floor spotless because it was a big grocery store warehouse. And that was, they wanted an impeccable cleanliness site. And that was my job. And I, I, I will tell you that I worked as hard cleaning that floor as I do today trying to get our next big job or trying to get our next proposal out the door. Yeah. You know, and did that and everything in between. And I'm just a believer that the harder you work, the luckier you get. Like opportunities will arise. You know, good things happen to people who do good things. And, you know, so that's why we're so community involved. Like it's just, it's pretty simple stuff. Yeah, that's so neat that that uh, you started, you know, right from sweeping floors and now someone as successful as you've become like I think a lot of our listeners, especially the younger guys that are listening right now that want to get into construction. Did you have a passion for construction before you started, you know, that first <laughs> job? Or did you think about construction career at all? No, I was a little I was a little messed up to be honest with you. It's a long story, but I was a little messed up with the whole having the baby at such a young age and yeah. you know, in Toronto being eighteen years old and working ninety hours a week and I had to get an apartment fast and I had to take care of my family and at the time and uh so I was, to be honest with you, I wasn't thinking about business, although all through high school I did, you know, paper routes, I had the hockey pools, I did mowing lawns, you shoveled driveways, you did, a, so you knew you were an entrepreneur, and I yeah. knew, I mean, my mom dropped me off at the airport, you know, at 18, and I was on my way to Toronto and dropped out, of, I let her down miserably by dropping out of university, but, you know, I said, mom, I'll be back, I'll be back, give me five or seven years, and I'll be back, and we'll start my own company, and, I'll, you know, it's all going to be great. So it took me eight or nine years, but I did come back and do it. So. Yeah, she must be happy now. <laughs> yeah, she's she's definitely very proud of her son and uh, all of her seven kids all turned out really well. So she's. Uh, I she's come from a family happy. of seven as well. It's not often I, I sit across the table. <laughs> so it's the same amount of siblings. We were a small one like, family back then. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, a little before my time, but not not that far. Yeah. So <clears throat> what about just maybe we can touch on, um, you know, the past year. It's been crazy for everyone in every industry. Uh, more so in some, obviously, construction being an essential service. There's blessing in that, but it's still really tough, all the uncertainty. What's been for you as the president of uh, a large general contracting firm in Atlantic Canada and Millwrights? Um, what's been the biggest thing? I know one of the things we were talking about earlier was material costs, and uh, but there's got to be all kinds of things. What's been the hardest part of that for you and your position? Um, you know what? I... I don't find it's been incredibly tough, to be honest with you. Yeah, we had to pivot. We had to make a lot of changes. And, you know, when it first was announced last March that we were going into a pandemic, it, that was stressful. That was, uh, oh, my God, we, things were just taken off. The city was booming. There was tons of work. You know, every contractor was busy. Any contractor that was very capable was doing incredibly well. And then it was like, oh, my God, is the bottom going to fall out of it? So that was the initial reaction was. But I was in a good position because I have a I have a – my real estate company called tier two properties, you know, we're, we're starting to be more active in developments and we're starting to, we've got a dozen or so of our own developments and we've got probably another dozen we're working on right now. So I said to, you know, Chris, our CFO, I've got to put, I, you know, I just got to roll up the sleeves and in case the bottom comes out of this thing, we got to make sure our own developments are strong so that we can keep our employees that we've had for 25 years, you know, busy. So I really hunkered down and I said, okay, I'm going to work seven days a week. You know, I'm going back to the old style. I was, I had things pretty good and, and uh, I just put my head down and I haven't taken my head up, but, you know, within three to four weeks, things kind of went back to normal in our industry. We adjusted really quickly. Um, we got to figure out the PPE and we got, you know, we had our, we had our weekly calls with our other competitors. We had a real good thing set up. We were learning from each other. And I think our, our industry in general adapted so <clears throat> crazy quickly. It's impressive the staff, how the industry responded. It's it? amazing how, how our staff and our industry so nimble to take something like that such a big thing and we just said we'll get through this guys and we never missed a beat so so we get through the first couple of months and you know i'm saying i think it's going to be okay and then we got back to normal and then we you know i think we actually got the wage subsidy for the first month and then yeah. things went back to normal we got busy again 
people realize that, hey, this industry is going to keep going. We're going to push through this thing. But then in my own development started taking off. So I can't underestimate, I spend 12 or 14 weeks in Florida over the winter. So uh, my staff has me now 7, 724. So yeah. I think I'm driving everybody a little crazy <laughs> around the office. They want you to go back to Florida, do they? <laughs> they want me to go back to Florida. They can't wait till you go back. <laughs> so the amount of opportunity that has, like all I see is opportunity in front of me through this whole thing this whole transition you know you look at i like doing what other people aren't doing i like thinking what other people aren't thinking like we're opening two hotels right now everybody says we're crazy but i think we're going to be open just in time to hit some of our busiest seasons mm-hmm. ever you know I, I just i'm thinking of a new restaurant concept that i'd like to get involved in i've got a lot of big development ideas on the Do go you want to talk about the restaurant vision a little no bit? i can't talk about the you restaurant can't, you vision. can't release <laughs> any secrets eh? stop secret come on doug come on. <laughs> you you pride yourself in being connect, in a, a connector And, you know, your business and yourself, uh, you're highly involved in the community. Um, I just have a list of things here. I'll read them off quickly. Um, You're the the chair on the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, trustee with the Sobeys Award of Excellence in Business Studies. I know we had Craig Donick on there. You were a mentor for him. We had him. uh, We have him on one of our episodes now with uh, PMCO. Um, board member with the Hurricanes Basketball Club, and then I have about 20 different uh, past co-chair, past chair of Mount St. Vincent University, Deaf and Hard of Hearing, Youth Association, advisor committee member of, uh, sorry, advisory committee member of Nova Scotia Community College, Mount St. Vincent University, annual Teleskins Golf Tournament, IWK Healthcare, IWK Foundation, uh, Building and Infrastructure, IWK, The Great Big Dig, uh, health board member at the Halifax Club Construction Association, Nova Scotia, and the list goes on and on. But just talk a little bit about how you keep the passion up. Uh, you're so engaged in the community, and I mean that's that's amazing. Uh, what's what's that about for you? Like whenever you're connecting people, and like th- there's something there. There's there's a passion there that I just want you to kind of touch on, and I think people would be interested in hearing about. Yeah, I think you know what if you want to dig really deep, I think it probably comes from my family and my mom, and you know just pushing us to do good things in the community. We had to do good things, you know. We mowed the lawn at the church at when I was twelve, you know. So, so I think you you know it's one of those things. Your family does a great job of bringing you up to show you to to be a good person, and uh, you know I I always say uh, give till it hurts. When I was with the IW Count Foundation, when I sat on the board of the foundation. Uh, um, they interviewed me one time. They said, you know, what's the right amount to give? And I said, give till it hurts. Give, like, what the hell? Just, you know, what if it's easy? If you're making lots of money, giving a little Can bit. Can you describe that deal. feeling you get when you do those things and you do give till it hurts and you, you push so hard? To, like some of these things that are not easy to accomplish and they take so much time out of your day. Plus you have businesses to run. Like, you, you know, it must be off. Like it must be amazingly satisfying to. It's It's incredibly satisfying. But, you know, I think one of the biggest things we can do in life is giving back to our community. And I say it in a very respectful way to everybody, because I think we all got to give in different ways. You know, um, some people go to the soup kitchen every Saturday. Some people yeah. give money. Some people sit on board. Some people chair events, you know? Um, so I think it's really, really important, you know, to find out where you think you can give, but it doesn't matter. Any one of those things, giving is, is a responsibility uh, it's a commitment to our community, and it's why we're here. So uh, I, I never looked at it as being work. It's always been when somebody asked right, me, and it's right. the right feeling. I just did it. And you always make time for the things that are important in your life. That's yeah. what's really important. Do you still feel that way about your businesses? That doesn't feel like work? Uh, these days, it's feeling like work. <laughs> I was getting there. I was just about getting there. You know, enjoying Florida and spending some time down yeah. there. I've, I've had a place since 2012 down there, so it's been a nice thing to draw me away from work. I've always been a workaholic. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think, uh, this, this, uh, uh, the last year or so has been an opportunity to get back and just make sure that we're going to come out on top and we'll be leading, you know, we want to lead the industry when this thing's all said and done, we want to be a leader and <laughs> not uh, the biggest thing for me is to make sure that, uh, you know, success has been something different for me all my life, but success today is seeing other people's success. So when I see an employee, you know, pull in the yard with a new car or I hear an employee's bought a house. Yeah. That's success to me because then we've done something together and achieved our goals. And that means so much to you, your employees. And you mentioned earlier, whenever, you know, the pandemic hit, that's one of the things on the forefront of your mind, right? How am I going to keep the great employees that I have that have helped build the business? How am I going to keep them employed? Is that what's, is that part of what's driving you when things are? Yeah. You know what? I, I think it's like a, I don't say it's a killer instinct, but it's like a killer instinct. You know, it's like, you know, you have to do it. You know, it's the right thing to do. I don't think I've ever thought about 
I have to, you know, I just know I got to keep busy. I, I don't want to lay people off. That's been one thing that, you know, has been really important to us as we get bigger as a company is that, you know, we tell staff, we try to keep these people busy all year round. Our carpenters, our laborers, our office staff. Um, we had a very short stint layoff at the beginning of COVID, but like I said, within a month, we had everybody back and that's kind of your goal. So I, I don't know if I think about it too much. I just know that that's yeah. the right thing to do. You don't have time to think about it. <laughs> I don't think I have time to think about it. Probably not. <laughs> so, yeah, you mentioned workaholic. Uh, you obviously, you're a very passionate entrepreneur. Um, it's like, do you have certain, I just think it's interesting to ask a person like yourself, do you have certain uh, personal things that you kind of have learned over the years to create a little bit of balance or like when you know things are heavy or you had a heavy year, just little things that you do personally to keep yourself healthy. Like, I just think that's something interesting to people because stress is something that, you know, often we don't take it seriously enough and then we should take it as serious as cancer because stress causes people, you know, mental health problems, all kinds of issues in the workplace. So it's, for someone like you in your position, is there, I don't know if it's advice or like personal things you do just to keep some kind of uh, balance with all the drive and passion that you have? That's a great question. <laughs> I don't think I'm very good <laughs> at it, to be honest. Come on, give us something, Doug. <laughs> but no, you know what? When I, when I, our first project as a company back, you know, 25 years ago, our first big project was Pete's Fritique at Sunnyside Mall. And Pete would say, Doug, the only hour I have free, we're going to meet at seven o'clock at the gym and from seven to eight. And I said, well, I don't go to the gym. He said, well, you're going to go to the gym if we're going to meet. Cause I told him we had to have a regular construction meeting. Yeah. And he's like, no, we got to meet the gym. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, is this guy on crack or what? He wants me to go to the freaking gym. So I get him like 6 a.m., yeah. get ready. And ironically, I've been going to the gym. We have a gym at the office um, today. You know, I was at the gym. So, you know, here's something I just knew, you know, Pete had taught me that. Did I know in the back of my head that, that I'd be going to the gym for 25 years? So, I mean, I, I try to balance it. Um, I'm your so tipper. exercise. Exercise is, is 100%. And you got to balance in general. Like, I'm one of those guys that, you know, everything I do, I do hard. So yeah. I work hard. I have fun hard. I go to the gym hard. Like, so I, I, you have to try to definitely balance it. I don't think I'm very good at it. Mm -hmm. I could learn something. You could probably, you could probably. I don't know me. about that, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take the compliment. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. You mentioned a project, uh, Pete's Fritique. Um, is there any projects over the years that stand out to you in Atlanta, Canada that you can talk about that went extremely well or that were really good for your company or just a great experience for whatever reason and then maybe one that didn't go so well and it kind of stands out and you just think like man i wish we would have done this or or maybe you don't even know sometimes you don't even know in a construction project why things aren't going well they just aren't and it's there's there's all these projects are going through my yeah, head i mean there's a hundred of each but well, maybe you can think of one or two I, I can tell you one and it's not a real big project but it was big enough to to be significant but we just we're finished today it's the lock courts over in um, in Dartmouth Crossing. There's a new set of lock courts going next to HRM. And we were asked in the 11th hour to come on board as a construction manager and a partner with Cushman and uh, working for Blaze Morrison. And I can tell you, this is this is a project, and I say leadership, you know. Um, you know, Blaze's leadership from the get-go was to put a team together that could put this lock court in from the start to finish. I think we had 11 weeks or it wasn't a great deal of time. It was extraordinary pressure. Um, the, the, um, Alberto was the designer, did an amazing job with form and design. I mean, they pull, turned around drawings, but it was, it was, you know, Blaze's leadership from a client, you know, said that we're going to put the right team together. We want to hire you guys. They interviewed our team. We had a, the choice to pick some preferred subs, which uh, one being Arsenal, uh, brothers have done the drywall and just the leadership level to pick the right team and make people think they were going to be a part of this team that was going to get this unreal, realistic uh, schedule achieved and I am impressed like you know it was a lot of little things along the way we had our client buying us lunch one day you know he had a breakfast served he brought over uh, you know uh, uh, one of the companies that served breakfast to everybody and it was just as long as everybody did they said they were going to do everybody was getting a pat on the back they were told they're going to be part of the team we worked weekends and nights and extra hours and I'm sitting here you know it took us right till yesterday to get done but they're moving in there tomorrow into this, you know, they're, they're holding court there in two days. And it was just amazing for me to watch the leadership all the way down from each company. Like every sub trade did a phenomenal job. And I hope they're listening because um, it's just amazing when you put a group of like-minded people in the same bucket and they share a vision. It's like your company taking off. This project was extraordinary. And again, it wasn't a huge project, but it was just so nice to see 
that there's still people out there have a desire to do well and act like a team in this industry, which was great. Yeah. Now the worst case, the worst project. <laughs> I, can't, I, I don't even know. I've got a few worst ones. Keep the so, profanity down, I'm, Doug. I'm Keep the to, profanity down on the show, please. I'm starting to think who I'm going to offend. <laughs> no, uh, you know, we had a, uh, we did the farmer's market, which I remember it was our first real big project at the time. And um, we down felt. Down here at the pier? Down at the pier, yeah. And we did that for uh, for the farmer's market and uh, the pier at the time. And it turned into be quite a disaster. It was a project that was way over budget. Uh, it, it was ironically, it was only six national contractors that were invited to bid and we're like we should be on that bid list there's lots of capable gcs that should be on that list and we were told we weren't and uh, they gave us an opportunity to pitch and put our our, uh, our best pitch forward and we did i challenged the team to say let's make this our best pitch ever and we got on the bid list so we're the only non-national uh, gc at the time and little did i know it would turn out to be the the, the nightmare on Elf street wish <laughs> i never went a, to that took that a few meeting. years took a few years off my life and uh you know, from no 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 one independent fault, it was a whole lot of things that just went wrong, and uh, you know, probably didn't have a realistic budget for what they wanted to achieve, and uh, it just it was a lot of effort. But you know, we go to every single project we do, we take it on, we own it a hundred percent, and we're there. And some go good, and uh, lots go good, and less go bad, but they go bad sometimes. Yeah, you mentioned you did a Sobeys job years ago in PEI with my, a couple of my uncles, Bert and Clarence and my father, Carl. <laughs> Do you remember that one? You said you remembered them working, you were working on the site in those days, right? Yeah, it was Sobeys University. And th those days we would do, I was, plug I was my family there just, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I was the project manager at the time. And I think your dad was the project manager and he still carried a tool belt at that time, I think, or at least came in, pretended yeah. like he did. But so did I at the time. I would be on the job sites at night, night shift and meeting the guys and, yeah. And in that store in particular, it was a brutal renovation. The, the store, if I remember correctly, was 24 hours a day. It's the Sobeys on University Avenue. Sobeys on University Avenue. We had to tear the entire storefront off mm -hmm. and expand out the side at the same time while keeping the grocery store live. So that's what we did, and we were really good at it. But if you didn't get that harmony with the trades, you know, with that leadership, and that's something we were really, really good at, you know, working around customers that are, are shopping, you know, trying to make, you know, that's where we realized what our... Uh, what our value was to, to live rentals and to the people like Sobeys and different operators at the time, we could adapt. Our staff would adapt to that. You know, you didn't curse and swear on site. You didn't smoke on site. You had to teach your employees not to do that if you wanted to be a leader. And everybody else that tried to compete against us, that was kind of our niche. We could, you know, we had that figured out. So we'd lose the odd one and it would go disastrous. And then we'd just go back to getting the next number of jobs. But that one in particular, oh my God, your guy, your your, uh, your dad and his brother at the time, they came in there, they got her done, they were the best trade on site, they did a fantastic well, they, job. They'll love to hear that, I'll have to make sure he watches this episode. <laughs> um, let's, I think you brought up something interesting when you said earlier, sub-trades, I know that's something that means a lot to you, especially as a GC and an owner, um, you know, your sub-trades, like, they're going to make or break your job, is that safe to say? Is that how you feel about them too? I mean, you said you work with a lot of your preferred subs. You get to have a relationship with them, and then it becomes more like not necessarily the low cost, but who do we feel comfortable coming in? Like maybe just talk about what sub trades mean to you, and the and how valuable the quality ones are, and the ones you can trust. And yeah, no, sub trades are no different than your own employees. I mean, you know, we're a relationship building company. That comes first. I mean, if you know Doug, you know Doug's unique ability is creating good, long lasting relationships, and I love doing it. It's it's easy. It's something yeah. you know. When you're really good at something or you love doing it, it's easy to do, right? I mean, you just come in every day and, and you do good things. So the sub-trades was, was always important to make sure they got paid. That was the number one thing for them. So, you know, we have a policy at RCS, you know, all when, when we receive owner's checks, I mean, we turn the, the, the uh, checks back around to the sub-trades within 48 hours. That's a policy. You know, so it's, it's little things. It's like... Uh, you know, I've built the relationship over the years with the subs that, hey, if it's short on cash and they need a, some money up front, like, we'll pay people up front. They, you know, there's nobody that's ever called me and couldn't resolve an issue. I mean, yeah. we've, we've, I don't know that we've ever been to court. You know, I think we were sued once in 25 years, and I think it got settled out of court. Probably so, a pretty good record compared so, to a lot of it. Hey, knock on wood, things can go wrong and it can go downhill, but yeah. you have to take care of people and, and you know, we do a lot of negotiated construction management work, so we don't necessarily sole source and work with one trade, but we can pick three very capable trades. So I want to make sure for my clients that we've gone out and, you know, did the due diligence, got them the most competitive bid, but we're not bringing, you know, people into the picture that can't do the work. So, 
you know, there's lots of great trades out there. And there's lots of great trades people. As much as people will say, oh, you can't find good people anymore. There's yeah. lots of great trades out there. And yeah. we see it every day. So um, I value the trades as much as I value our own employees. I mean, we've got to try to work together and be happy together, be successful together. Yeah, I love, love hearing you say that, just coming from a, you know, a, a family of, uh, in, in construction as a subcontractor. That's, uh, that's amazing for, to, hear, uh, to hear you say that. Um, maybe I could – I, I want to run through a few because this is – when I did your intro, I didn't want to read through all the <laughs> awards because I didn't want to know if you would be comfortable with that. But maybe I'll read through a few of them and you can just tell me a little backstory of what it meant to you. Uh, there's some amazing stuff on here. Um, so, yeah, I'll start here um, – Quantum Shift finalist 2008. Um, that would have been around the time uh, where you had some struggles that you mentioned earlier. Um, 2014, ranked 36 in Progress Magazine's top 101 Atlantic Canadian businesses. Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award finalist in 2013. Um, best Managed Company Program 2012. Uh, 50 Best Managed Companies. 2015 Halifax Business Awards. Business of the Year Bronze Award winner. Um, again, 2015 ranked 25th in Progress Magazine's top 101 Atlantic Canadian businesses. General Contract Award of Recognition, Brendan Nobes, 2017, CCA Awards. 2018 winner of the General Contract Award at the NLCA Rock Awards. And recently, 2021 winner of Atlantic Business Magazine's Reader's Choice Award of Best Atlantic Construction Renovation Company. W is any one of them kind of stand out and means more than the others? Like, is there one that... Uh, to you stuff. and your company, or they're all, they're all great uh, milestones. Yeah, no, I mean they're they're all awesome, and what they do, essentially, what they do is they they give you an opportunity to build your team. So every one of those awards, there was a night out, there was a party, you know, there was a celebration. So it really gives you, you know, it's part of your culture. It becomes part of your culture. Your employee, it's not it's not a Doug recognition. Most of those are company recognitions. So we celebrated them all together. We've had great times. I mean, I think the probably the biggest one that stands out for me was um, the inaugural event of the the chair for the Great Big Dig. So the, we had an event in Halifax that raised money for the IWK called the Great Big Gig, and it was Phil Otto who had chaired that event. And Phil came to me and said, Doug, we'd like to talk to you about taking this event over as chair for the IWK. And I was sitting on the board of the hospital, I think, at the time, and uh I said, Phil, I don't know. Like, you're doing this stuff. Like, I, I mean, I'm really impressed with what you... I was at the event last year, and and I'm like, it's not really our stick. Like, uh, I, all your contacts wouldn't be my contacts, so I don't know how I would maintain. My fear would be I'd get involved, and we wouldn't raise or do better than you did, you know, the previous year. And he said, oh, that's a great point. And I said, can we rebrand it? And he said, absolutely, re rebrand it. And I don't know if it was Phil or me at the time that said let's call this thing the great big dig for, for the, con I said, now it's a construction industry thing. I can get all my competitors to get around it. I know, love my competitors. I'm good friends with a lot of them and I know they will own this. Our industry will own this event. And he said, give it, give it a go. So we started a new event called the great big dig for, and I was the inaugural uh, first chair and I chaired it for three years. And I think in the first year we, we, we generated $200,000 for the hospital. And I think, it was three fifty the year I left, and I think last year they, you know, they raised upwards of four or five hundred thousand dollars, and it's gone on to have a multiple of chairs from the industry. Yeah, you know, Corey Bell, John Fleming, uh, uh, Renee involved. In Renee, that. Renee's had it. <coughs> I'm just trying to think who has it now, and uh, right. John Wills was the other one. Oh, yeah, okay. and the Flemings from Ocean. So, so the event has gone on. I mean, they had an event this year, a virtual event, which was incredibly successful. I think it was over four hundred thousand dollars they raised. And I mean, so it's it's an industry like our industry put its arm around the event and said, yeah. "This is for a great <clears throat> cause of the IWK, and uh, we're going to own this thing." So it's just awesome. Wow, what a what a great uh, initiative that is, and what it's come to be for for those kids at the IWK to have a check like that to we present to that. We did another one too. Dan was the Arthritis Society, so that was. Uh, that was where they got to uh, roast me. So the roast for the I heard roast. of that, and I wasn't able to make it, but I would have had a few digs there for you. <laughs> so it was a it was a, it was a fun opportunity to be involved, and I highly recommend anybody gets the opportunity to do it. Like here, you can go out and have a lot of fun with your colleagues, friends, yeah, you know, business associates, and raise a bunch of money. We raised over three hundred thousand that night for uh, for the society. So yeah, I've seen some of those roasts on YouTube, like the roast of Justin Bieber and the roast of so wasn't so that Charlie Sheen? It wasn't as good as <laughs> it was, was. No, but I did Close. I did have uh, I. Did 
did have some really, really good roasters. So <laughs> I bet. I was very fortunate. There would have been a lot of people spending some time coming up with some good lines for that <laughs> one. I wanted to ask you, as, as a president, as a person in your shoes, um, just if you could quickly, like, what does a day look like for you at work? What, what are you spending most of your time? Is it RFPs? Are you involved in, are you going to the meetings when you guys have meetings on projects for the tender process? Like, what, what does a day look like to you or a week? Where's your time spent? <laughs> I don't have any idea. <laughs> I think I could be, I think, you know, it's, it's a moving target these days. It's not defined. I won't say it's defined. At one time it was very defined, but now it's just, you know, the last four weeks um, have been extraordinary just trying to manage our, you know, uh, prices are fluctuating. Um, we're having supplier issues, you know, because of all the history with COVID here, things are starting to hit us in a different way. So we're having to change on a, on a daily basis. But a typical day for me is, um, I, they're all different because I have site days where I try to get outdoor sites. I typically try to get out once a month with every project manager. We would have probably nine or 10 project managers. I get out once, once a month and see their sites. And other than that, I don't get to a job site unless there's issues. If a client has concerns, I get out and I try to put out fires. But my leadership team's done an extraordinary job of, of trying to get to those fires before they get to me. And for me, it's, you know, it's uh, the first hours. I'm usually at the gym at uh, 6.30 in the morning. And then uh, I'm sitting up in my office uh, 7.30, between 7.30 and 8. Um, I get on the emails, get caught up. I always have a stack of to-dos. So my to-dos from the previous day, I start hitting those off in between yeah. calls and emails. I'm one of those guys. If I'm not doing four things, I'm not. I'm not doing my best. So I'm really good being on a Zoom call, doing emails. Lots of those this year. Eh? <laughs> the Zoom calls have been good. I think overall the Zoom calls have uh, been just a real good energy for me. I don't know why, because a lot of people I think struggle with them. But I think for me, it's just been a better way to present things. I, I find our job meetings. Uh, you know, when we can get on a design build meeting with our client. Uh, we're doing a, a new banquet facility in Fox Harbor right now, and we're going through the design build process. It's extraordinary to bring drawings up, and we're, you know, the owner's able to draw what he sees, yeah. and I race that and draw what I see, and yeah. we're, we're looking at it, we're sharing notes, and I think there's never been a more efficient process working. You know, we've got six designers around the table yeah. and consultants, and we're all coming up with really, really good ideas, and we're looking at the drawings together. And it's never been that efficient. Are you so. using just Zoom to do the uh, the collaboration? Just to annotate, on the, annotate yeah. on Zoom, yeah. and uh, yeah, you can reverse. I mean, you can bring up so much stuff really, really quickly at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Where you know you would have had to go look for a set of drawings in the back room, and oh, I don't have that paper with me. If you're on a site going through these meetings, yeah. you just wouldn't be as equipped as you are today. So, I mean, it's extraordinary what COVID has done for our industry and all businesses in general. I know you really enjoy probably getting to site once a month with your PMs and seeing the guys working and stuff like that. Is that one of the favorite parts of your job? Yeah, there's no question. I, it's disheartening that I can't get there more because that's what I, when we do our yeah. surveys with our staff, you know, one of the things that long-term employees say is, uh, you know, we don't see Doug enough anymore and we don't get out enough. But, you know, I, I, I we just did an Ahsoka, which is a state of the company address the other day where we had you know, mandatory for all the staff to get on a Zoom call and I presented for an hour and a half of what we got. So those are the kind of ways that I have to make up for that past history of getting out and just patting somebody in the back and buying coffees. It would be never uncommon for me to show up on a job site on a Saturday with a tray of coffees or, yeah. you know, a couple of pizzas under my arm. And I always thought that was incredibly, you know, pe people really, really appreciated being appreciated. It's yeah. a simple thing to do. Like for yeah. me to show up, at a, I mean, I was on the site on Saturday at the, at the law courts, you know, just to yeah. say hey and say hi and have a few private conversations with some of the team. Yeah, I think it's it's one of them things like everyone needs affirmation. Sometimes we don't know how to ex express that we need it, but we know when we get it that it feels good and we and we do need it. And we probably need it more than so I can I could uh, definitely see how, you know, someone at the top coming down to to a site or, or whatnot and just being present and showing appreciation how how far that would go. Goes a long way. Little things go a long way. Yeah. Um, what's your vision for the next five years? I know you said you're you're innovating, you're, you're building hotels, you've got the restaurant thing going on that you don't want to keep under wraps. <laughs> but as far as the you know retail and construction as a general contractor and mill rights, like where do you see things going? What's your goals like for the you know next the near future, the next three to five years? Well, I think there's a couple of things that come to mind, Dan. I would say. Um, I was sitting in the office uh, not too long ago. We were at one of our real estate meetings with our team on the real estate side, and I just said, concept to keys. That's our tagline. And we were talking about our logo, and should we change it? And I'm like, it's concept to keys. And 
Dave, who's uh, just started with us at the time, came back with a little wheel the next day he had drawn up and he said like, and I'm like, oh my God, that makes so much sense. And so it's kind of like a vertically integrated uh, circle of what does concept to keys look like? So, you know, Doug sitting with a guy that an old friend or a colleague that he worked with in the past and says, hey, I'd like to have a pet store in Tantalon. Well, I put my landlord hat on and I say, well, we'll build you a building and we can be your landlord. And, you know, tier two properties hires RCS to be his contractor and RCS hires Millwright to be their mill worker. And uh, we just started a new company called PM Co. As you, I think you had the guys on, on here. That's right. So PM Co. will manage the property and hopefully it's an amazing experience. And in 10 years, when they go to renovate their place or build on or addition, they'll hire RCS again and we'll do the circle all over again. Yeah. So it's concept of keys. Like I literally meet people and we start drawing up sketches on a napkin and then, yeah. you know, I'm delivering them their keys two years from and now. I, se I sense that's something that really keeps you passionate is the vision side of things. You're a visionary. Uh, you've created these companies and it's just, it's never going to end. You're never going to not be passionate about that. I can't help myself when a client opens a window so when a client says i might think or i've thought about doing this and then i get home and i'm thinking he was thinking he wanted to renovate his house and i'll be then saying give me your plans i want to look at your host plan like i can't help myself when a client opens a window for help that you don't reach out and help and it, sometimes it means nothing to me sometimes it's a connection that i pass along sometimes it's an opportunity you know i, I met a guy on a plane <coughs> excuse me i met a guy on a plane one time and Pete used to always say to me, Doug, you know, you're always on the plane. We'd be sitting on a plane traveling. He'd say, you're on the plane. You're just always busy. You're doing your emails. You got your earphones on. He said, like, do you ever sit and meet the guy next to you? I said, like, shit, I don't know if I ever have. So <laughs> I started thinking about that. And I've made, it, I've made a point of all my life doing that. And I've literally met people on a plane. I met this gentleman on a plane that was running CHC helicopters. And three weeks later, we had a $40 million pitch into him to build him a hel helicopter hangar. Like, you don't realize the opportunities that are missed if you don't reach a little bit or if you don't get mm -hmm. yourself outside your comfort zone. So now that uncomfortable part of my is, 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 is my comfort zone. That, like, reaching out beyond is my comfort zone. And I don't sit very often next to anybody anywhere that I don't come away with some kind of an opportunity. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Do you see yourself as a creative person who thinks outside the box? <laughs> Yeah, you know, are you really going to ask that question? <laughs> I am going to ask it. Because well, I think that's a big part of entrepreneurialism, and it's very hard to make creativity mo monetize it. But if, you, like, if you're in a job where you can't be creative, you're, gonna be, you're not going to be content. Is that right? You have to be able to have the vision me, and, be, and create. Yeah, you know what, Dan, it's, it's a tough, everybody's different. You know, we do all these Colby reports and different reports on, on people's personalities, and we all attack a problem a different way, you know. Uh, some people need to take it home and think about it. Like, I can't understand when we can sit at a table that people need to get back to you on something. I'm like, well, let's just decide now. It doesn't make sense yeah, to me. Right. You know, so creativity for me is just natural. But it's yeah. not natural for everybody. And no, it's not that's for right. everybody. That's right, yeah. For me, I have to be under pressure. If, if I'm under pressure, like that last week before vacation is the best week of my year. You get more accomplished in that week because I know I'm never going to be able to enjoy yeah. myself on vacation if you I didn't get every last detail taken care of. Yeah. So that drives me. So I try to put myself under pressure constantly. Diamonds every are made week. under pressure. <laughs> Diamonds are made <laughs> under pressure. But it's not for everybody. No. And it took me a lot of time to realize that some people at the table need to be able to take that home, yeah. consume it, come back, and give yeah. me very good advice the next day, or maybe talk me off the edge, or maybe say, you know what, Doug? I don't think your idea is so great. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. Anything that you want to, I know we're, we're, we're going to close out uh, pretty soon here. I'm just wondering, is anything on your mind, anything you want to close out with uh, to the audience? Uh, I know you, you're a great personality uh, in the Atlantic Canadian uh, construction community. You've such a, played such a major role, and it's so great to have you on the show. So I just want to kind of open the floor if there's anything you want to close with. Yeah, I think I, I would close with four things that weren't as important to me a year ago that are incredibly important to me now. I'd say four pillars that will very quickly rise to the top of uh, things we want to think about as a company going forward. And these will apply to all of our companies. And they are somewhat a result of COVID. And not necessarily a result, but COVID has allowed us to think about them. And I, I will say um, it, diversification and is a huge pillar. The top four pillars for me going forward now is... Diversification. I say that when I come, when I'm meaning, not just not just with staff and employee picks and who we want to work with and 
you know, love to see all, all our females. We're getting more and more females out on the site all the time. But just qualified people, having qualified people, um, that's a big must. But also diversification. COVID's taught us to be diversified with our jobs. We need to diversify so that we don't put all our eggs in one basket. And if we ever get into another pandemic, you know, we've got a really good diverse portfolio, That uh, a diversified portfolio when it comes to real estate. You know, if I had been in the hotel business, it wouldn't have been a very good zone the last 12 months. So, you know, having a diversified list of companies is going to be important. Um, the other, the one, there's a lady, uh, Randy, um, Mandy Renahov. Have you ever heard of her? Freshco? Uh, I don't know. Check her out. She's a lady from Yarmouth. She's an amazing story. And she talks a lot about employee diversification. She's the largest tenant leasehold um, contractor in like Canada. And she does all kinds of accounts down in the U.S. I chased her online, picked up the phone. I was able to get a hold of her one day. We've had a couple of really great conversations. Yeah. But she's been on breakfast television, Morning America. She's been on every TV show in North America. And she just thrives on employee diversification. And she was telling me that there's companies now that have a, a, a employee diversification checklist, like if, if you know whether it be Home Depot or or one of the major brands in North America, if you don't check check the box on diversification, they don't want you working for them. So that's one. Uh, mental wellness is a huge one. Uh, I hate the words mental health. I think we need to change the names. It's a big, big problem. But mental wellness just sounds that's a, a great point. Better. Mental wellness does sound better. Like let's worry about keeping people well, and we have. Our EA, EAP program at the office where people can confidentially call in and get advice. And there's things like that that we have to pay more attention to going forward. And the reason I bring it up, my old boss that was one of my mentors when I when I first started, I would say it was probably 94, 93, I started working for him in Ontario. Most confident guy I knew, 35, family business, executive, you know, always draw, sharp, real sharp-dressed guy incredibly confident we just happened to reconnect 25 years later haven't talked to him since i started my business talked to him six months ago and he now speaks about mental wellness around uh, the u.s he lives in the u.s and he's saying doug do you know that i struggle daily with mental health issues i'm like john you're the most confident guy you crazy he yeah. said i couldn't get through the day yeah. and then i was had to turn to drugs to get through the day and then eventually i had to leave the family business because it couldn't cope and i'm like you got to be freaking kidding me. You were the most confident guy. So here, from a visual perspective, I'm looking at mm -hmm. the most confident guy I know mm -hmm. that dealt with this issue on a daily basis. And he eventually took a year and a half off and he dealt with it. He wrote a book and he's actually developed a formula to say how much mental health affects, you know, every company. Because we, we all know of a couple of people that are definitely struggling, but how many that we don't know is what's scary. Yeah. So mental wellness is a big one. Um, digitization is huge obviously for obvious reasons here we are today mm -hmm. um on every level i say digital platform the best digital platform that i know of today was the cell phone when it came out when the first iphone was launched we got our first digital platform i'm looking for the next digital platform for our company as a whole that we can live and die by from everything from file storage to running projects to you know and just it's fully every, integrated and yeah. we need a platform yeah. so the first person that invents that platform and the number fourth thing is engagement in this new world. Engaging staff, we nailed engagement. Like we have a great engagement. We have, you know, a really, really good group of people. We've culture is number one at RCS. And it, but, but this new world requires a new type of engagement. You know, when I do a, my SOCA address, my state of the company address, how do we engage? So we were able to do breakout rooms in our Zoom calls. We were able to get people chatting within each other. Because like, just sitting here listening and watching for an hour is not the coolest thing. We need to engage people. So people are going to be working home more. They're going to be living differently. So how do we create that new culture? And they're the top four things. So Any, any, any details on how you're doing that now? As I, far as getting people engaged when they're working from home, the different different specifics through covid we had to do the zoom calls and the social hours and all that stuff but you know that's not enough we have to go deeper um so for going forward we realize now that if you do an agm or a soca that doing it virtually is the way to go but you have to have breakout rooms you have to get you have to ask yeah. questions you yeah. have to get people asking questions differently they can't put their hand up and speak anymore so yeah. like it's just little things like that but yes we're just touching on it yeah. but it's definitely a pillar that we're going to be spending a lot more time on as we go forward 
Awesome, Doug. Well, listen, I want to really thank you for, for coming on the on the show. I know you're busy, and it's just been great for me to be able to sit here and for all of our listeners at the podcast team. Really appreciate your time, and it's, it's been great having you. Well, listen, thanks for having me. I really appreciate you coming out. I think what you're doing here, Dan, is a fantastic idea. Um, I told you coming in, I was just almost on your heels. I was going to do this. I Beat think the, you indus- to it. <laughs> the industry, no, we will support you 100%, and I hope people really appreciate this because it takes a lot of time and energy. So thanks for putting it together. Thanks a lot, Doug. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Atlanta Construction Podcast. Be sure to follow us on any podcast platform you use. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Instagram at Atlanta Construction Podcast. Be sure to send us a comment or a review. We'd love to engage with you.